Georgia Traveler is made possible in part by the Georgia Tourism Foundation. We all have dreams. To wear the green jacket. Mm -hmm. To see wild horses. To catch a major league ball. To create memories with my family. Put your dreams in motion. Visit Georgia.org. And by People are drawn to this state for its unbelievable beauty. We're working hard to keep it that way. We're Georgia Power, proud sponsor of the programming that also enriches our lives. And by the Ray M. and Mary Elizabeth Lee Foundation. And by supporters of Georgia Public Broadcasting. Thank you. Hello everybody and welcome to Georgia Traveler. I'm your tour guide, Gerald Bryant. We are in Macon at the Cherry Blossom Festival because this week we are visiting beautiful and historic Southwest Georgia. We've got some great stories for you, but first here are some of the sights and sounds you'll experience when you visit the area. Now maybe if you go overboard at a festival, you might see a pink elephant, but I bet you've never seen Lacey the Pink Poodle. How you doing, Lacey? Lacey looks like she might enjoy the Georgia National Fair, too. The celebration is held in October every year in Perry, almost 30 miles south of Macon. Whether you spend one full day or even one week at the Georgia National Fair in Perry, Georgia, you still may not have enough time to see it all. So who better than some veteran fair fanatics to help me explain at least a fraction of the festivities? My name's Zeke. Zeke the Hillbilly. Zeke the Hillbilly. This is a very interesting uh, conveyance behind you. Tell me about the car back here. Well, that's an old 1929 Model A town sedan that's been converted into a hillbilly RV. Can you tell me your name? Well, my name is Cassius, and I'm from the Perry And what are you doing at the fair? Oh, I'm teaching the little ones about fire safety and just having a good time. Eat a few corn dogs, and what's your name? Now, wait a minute, you're a dog, right? That's right. And your favorite food is corn dog? Corn dogs, baby. <laughs> Isn't that kind of weird? Well, you know, it's a farming thing. Good. <laughs> What's the best thing you've had to eat What's all the Oh, the pork tenderloin sandwich. So you'd recommend the pork yes, tenderloin? Yes, yes. Anybody had an elephant here? Yeah. Yeah, we can uh, we'll have to go no, What's the next best thing? The surface. The funnel cake. Not the funnel cake. The funnel cake. What's the difference between an elephant here and a funnel cake? Small cake is made with a uh, pancake batter. It's a little smaller and about so yeah. thick. We just had one of those. Part of the flour base with sugar, salt. And it came out about this big around and so thick. Crispy. Oh, nice. Here is the final test. Yeah, okay. I'm going to let you Wait. tear off the piece. Come on. Okay. Come on, let's try. Let we try should have made it bigger for TV. You sure <laughs> should have. That's big enough. Oh, it's hot. It's supposed to be. Uh, I got the one with the cinnamon. Yeah, that's fine. And there's a really good elephant here. Well, tell me what the famous act of Ed and Geraldine does. 
Well, what it is is an interactive little entertainment show for everybody, especially the boys and girls who want to join us playing rhythm instruments. Look, it's the elephant ear crowd. After a full day of activities, nighttime offers just as much excitement. You can shoot some hoops. There you go. Finally. <laughs> you can play this swiffle ball laundry basket game, which I could never seem to figure out. Oh, man, what you doing? Watch a world-class fireworks display high in the sky. Or look even higher in the sky and see a professional tight roper whose words from above change the way I live my life. For always remember that life is not measured by the breaths that we take, but rather by the moments that leave us breathless. Wow, I'm speechless, at least until the next Georgia National Fair where I'm sure Patches the Fire Safety Dog, Zeke the Hillbilly, and the Crazy Elephant Ear Gang will be there to guide me through. Almost 80 miles north of Macon, Phil finds some famous down-home southern cooking in Social Circle. Hey, this is Phil for Phil's Fantastic Food Finds and where are you finding me today? On the streets of historic Social Circle. Now they tell me if you come to Social Circle, there's one place that you've got to eat. Where is it? It's the Blue Willow Inn. Come on, let's go check it out. Hello, Miss Scarlett, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. You look good. Look, I came here to eat. I understand this is the place to go. It's absolutely excellent. Have you ever eaten with us before? No, I hadn't. Well, you are in for a treat. Ooh. All Southern Buffet. A southern. Fried chicken, Fried. macaroni and cheese. Mac and cheese. Candied yams. I have died and gone to food heaven. Oh, honey, you are there. Oh, is that the door? That's the door. I'm gone. Go Bye. see you, <laughs> You know what? I found my way to the kitchen. You knew I would. I'm here with the food diva herself. This is Ann Lowe. She's the head cook here at the Blue Willow Inn restaurant. And I understand we're making one of the specialties of the restaurant. What is it? Chicken and dumplings. So Ann, how do we actually make, what are, we, what are you doing right now? What's in the pot? In the pan I have uh, flour, water, and butter. Okay. And I'm going to pinch it and drop it in the pot. What's in the pot? What are we cooking it in? Chicken broth and butter. Chicken broth and butter. Mmm, don't tell Ann, but I'm fast becoming a fan of chicken and dumplings. Man, these dumplings look good. I think I just... Stop that. Wait till it's done. So we drop our chicken in, and ooh, doesn't that look good? I mean, you, you almost not even want to let it finish cooking. So we just kind of stir it up a little bit. You're saying that I should probably taste this. Oh, that's delicious. And I think I'm going to have to have some more, so we probably need to go find me a bowl. You just never know where I'm going to pop up. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Look at this. Beans. Oh, veggies. String beans. Oh, man, that looks like a cheese casserole. Some type mashed potatoes. Oh, this could probably get dangerous after a while. Look at the fried okra, fried green tomatoes, my favorite. Oh, collard greens, turnips, and there's that uh, uh, Salisbury steak that I was going to be dipping my biscuits into. Fried chicken, ham. Oh, this is going to be such a wonderful treat. And uh, ooh, look. So now since I helped prepare the chicken and dumplings, I will now get a little sample. And uh, what looks good, I actually have my stamp of approval on it. And uh, get my spoon here and uh, join me at the table. Now having been in the kitchen preparing this, I now have an opportunity to sample it. And my good friend and buddy, Gerald Bryant, is here. Gerald, how you doing today? Did they really call you dumpling when you were a kid? They did, man. And I think it was because of my uh, lack of height. But uh, I had a chance to do a little preparation in the kitchen, the chicken and dumpling. I don't know if you had a chance to sample it, but uh, here goes. Mm. Oh, good. Mm. Mm. 
You know, when they said it was an all-you-can-eat buffet, it didn't mean you had to eat it all. I thought that's what all-you-can-eat is. You gotta leave something for somebody else. Why? Good question. Anyway. Scarlet, Scarlet. Woo! Oh. You know when you told me to go in there and eat? Yeah? I did. What was that line you had from that movie? You mean when I said I'll never go hungry again? You ain't lying. <laughs> Ooh. Next, it's off to Fitzgerald, just over 105 miles southeast of Macon. We'll find more chicken, but they're not on a plate with dumplings. Fitzgerald, Georgia is a town with a rich and amicable history, but this place is also known for chickens. These aren't your average hen house chickens. These fast, lean, and colorful birds hail from the jungles of Burma in Southeast Asia. My first experience with these birds was probably over 40 years ago. The Department of Natural Resources had, had imported them from Burma and brought them over to South Georgia for the purpose of releasing them so as to hopefully introduce a new game bird one way or, the, or another they eventually found their way into town. Now, the experiment of introducing them as a wild game bird did not work out, but apparently in town they have enough protection that they have, uh, they have thrived and have survived very well uh, for many years now. Fitzgerald, Georgia is located right in the heart of Dixie, and no doubt when you're here, you'll run into some wild Burmese chickens. And they've been around here for about 40 years, so I guess that makes Fitzgerald, Georgia, the original home of the Dixie Chicks. I don't know what it is about Fitzgerald that they particularly like, but uh, the environment here has been very conducive for them, and they have multiplied and thrived through the years. So instead of dangerously hunting the Dixie Chicks in their neighbors' backyards, many Fitzgerald Ridians have embraced them and made them an honorary member of the town. Track down Jan Gelders and you may have the opportunity to visit the original chicken house. I have rescued a lot of them that have been hit by cars or different things, raised the chicks or whatever. And the fact that these chickens fly, they stay in flight like birds for a long distance. So they're really interesting to watch. While you're chasing chickens around the streets of Fitzgerald, you may notice the streets are named after both Confederate and Union generals. Longstreet, ironically, being one of the shorter roads in town. This was done by Philander Fitzgerald and the original city planners, who created a town unlike any other in the late 1800s. Mr. Fitzgerald thought that the someone would establish a colony somewhere in the Southland and bring all of those Union veterans down here. It would get them away from the bitter windows and away from the drought-stricken area. At this time, the wild Burmese chickens weren't around yet to attract tourists to Fitzgerald, but they had something more unique for Southern visitors to observe. They scheduled excursion trains in here and advertised it widely for people to come and get a look at the Yankees. At the Blue Gray Museum, you can learn all about why Fitzgerald was created, the challenges its founders encountered, and hear the stories that have been passed down through generations. As a result of them coming here and settling and the Confederates coming over and joining them, um, they were always amiable, uh, never really any severe need for law enforcement. Those that had worn the blue and those that had worn the gray, marching as one behind the stars and stripes. They were saying to Georgia and the nation of the world, as far as they were concerned, that old war was over and done with forever. And this was again the United States of America. Here it was, old wounds were healed, old barriers broken, as men who had met on the field of battle, met again on the field of everyday living, and taught this nation and the world an unforgettable lesson in forgiving and forgetting. There was a major event in U.S. history that took place in South Georgia before Yanks and Rebs were living together in harmony. About 10 miles north of Fitzgerald, Confederate President Jefferson Davis was captured in the town of Irwinville on May 10, 1865. 
Our research shows anywhere between 3 a.m. in the morning to 6 a.m. Now, where the monument stands, that's the actual spot where he was captured at. Now, we assume that his camp was somewhere probably anywhere between 10 to 20 yards to the west of the monument itself. There are rumors that when captured, Davis was disguised as a woman and wearing a dress. The rumors about him being in a dress are what they are, they're rumors. Uh, yellow journalism of the day played a big part of it. They wanted to actually make Davis to be, I reckon, a bad guy because, well, he was the president of the other side. So it, it just turned out that he was not in a dress. Even in official records, uh, the War of the Rebellion came out in 1890, I do believe, and it actually states in there from Union officer that he was not in a dress, that his wife actually put a black shawl around his shoulders when he was exiting his tent. The first thing you get to see is where the Civil War actually ended. Over 600,000 men died and women, children, died in that war. So by the capture of Jeff Davis right here, you actually stopped all that because Davis was heading west to pose, possibly actually hook up with another detachment that was out in Texas. If he would have hooked up with another detachment, you could have looked at the war anywhere between another year to two years, and possibly two to three hundred, more than 100,000 dead. But he was captured here, one mile north of Irwinville, Georgia. So when you travel from Fitzgerald to Irwinville, watch out for the chickens who may be crossing the road. And more importantly, sit down and take the time to learn about some important stories in Georgia and American history. And we'll visit the exact, well, the probable, or at least the possible geographic center of Georgia. There are some very interesting things to see in Twiggs County, including some beautiful historic old buildings, even a site where Revolutionary War hero, the Marquis de Lafayette once visited. But you know what else is here? Right behind me, the geographical center of Georgia. Trust me, it's back there. This sign denotes uh, this particular site as the geographic center of the state of Georgia. And we're proud of it because we know that uh, we are central to the whole entire state. My lovely assistant David Zelsky will assist me in explaining how the geological experts approach this study. Now the center is defined as the balance point of a plane in the shape of an area. So the geologist took a plaque of metal cut out to the exact size of Georgia in scale, then balanced it on an apex of a point. In our precise scientific reenactment, that apex will be the cap of a honey bear. Once it balanced perfectly, the study was finished and they concluded that Marion, Georgia was indeed the exact center of the state of Georgia. The central point is one mile southeast of the junction of Turbin and Savage Creeks in Twiggs County, here in this general area, either over here or somewhere around here, maybe up under here. I believe this stump has some significance. So anyway, when venturing to Twiggs County in search of Georgia's center, take some time to visit a few historic sites and don't worry, there'll be no unexpected traffic jams. We don't have the first red light here in Twiggs County. We've got a four-way stop. And with that, that denotes the rural atmosphere as well as the people that live here. We're one of the last bastions of the country folk. Back in Macon, it's time to check out some Georgia Halls of Fame. What do rock stars and sports stars have in common? Well, if you're from Georgia, then one day your underwear will be on display in Macon. Well, okay, maybe not your underwear, but perhaps a jacket, a jersey, or your favorite guitar. There are a lot of guitars, and I mean a lot of guitars, on display at the Georgia Music Hall of Fame. We now have over 30,000 objects in the collection. I don't want them to sit back there and never be seen by anybody again. I don't want the music not to be heard. I want people to enjoy this. That's why I've collected it. The heart of the museum is Toontown, a magical mystery tour through Georgia's music history. But does Georgia really have enough music history to fill a whole town? You bet. We have an unfair number of people that come from Georgia that have greatly influenced culture. The South in general, if it ever were to rise again, has risen in its music because the music from the South has influenced American popular culture. That influence is on display at the rollicking Rhythm and Blues Review featuring the music of Ray Charles, Otis Redding, and James Brown. 
Just across the street is a chapel which explores the origins of gospel music and inside the Gretsch Theater, music videos play to capacity crowds. And like the great rock and roll musicians featured here, the exhibits of the Georgia Music Hall of Fame are best seen and experienced live and in person. I've got another theory. If you get to heaven and you don't know how to play a harp, they give you one of these. But for some music fans, they've already found heaven, right here at the Georgia Music Hall of Fame. But for others, heaven would be the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame, located just down the street. The largest museum of its kind in the nation, the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame is chock full of exhibits and interactive displays featuring a NASCAR simulation, an indoor basketball court, and even a football field. The entire down floor is focused on the Hall of Famers who've been inducted. We've got high school, collegiate, Olympic, Paralympic, and professional sports. So we have all those areas. So rather than compete, these two halls of fame complement, making Macon a clear destination for jocks and rockers alike. About 30 miles northeast of Macon, we find Milledgeville, Georgia's fourth capital city. Antebellum capital of Georgia, Milledgeville is a wonderful example of southern charm and beauty. Founded in 1803 and named for then Georgia Governor John Milledge, Milledgeville is a great destination for casual tourists and history buffs alike. And there is no better way to experience all that Milledgeville has to offer than by taking a trolley tour. Milledgeville served as the capital of Georgia from 1804 to 1869, and this part of its history is beautifully represented by the old Capitol building. Construction began in 1805 and would take 30 years to complete. Designed in the Gothic Revival style, the old Capitol building played host to some of the most important events in Georgia's history, including a debate in 1861 on whether or not Georgia should secede from the Union. All along the streets of Milledgeville, you'll find antebellum homes. Antebellum is not a particular house style, but refers to a period in which the home was built, in this case, before the Civil War. Most antebellum homes are in the Greek Revival, Classical Revival, or Federal style. Grand, symmetrical, and with center entrances, large balconies, and columns or pillars. A fine example of the antebellum period is Lockerley Hall, built in 1839. Unlike many other antebellum homes in the area, Lockerley has not been significantly altered or expanded, and thus the observer does not lose the original vision of its designer. The grounds around the plantation are now home to Lockerley Arboretum, showcasing plants native to the Georgia Piedmont. Another estate of note is Andalusia, the picturesque farm of American author Flannery O'Connor. At Andalusia, O'Connor found the farm as the source for settings, situations, and fictional characters that are the signature of her stories. Quite often, Flannery would use a farm setting, um, and of course she drew straight from the source here, not only with the settings, and equipment and structures, but even some of her fictional characters uh, reflect real life people that were here. After your trolley tour, make your way to downtown Milledgeville. Spend some time browsing through the many antique shops or dine in a quaint restaurant. When visiting downtown, don't miss Memory Hill Cemetery. It was originally one of the four public squares in the 1803 town plan. Memory Hill holds the resting places for renowned Georgia Congressman Carl Vinson and American author Flannery O'Connor. So come and explore historic Milledgeville and soak up the history, the nature, and the classic Southern charm. That concludes our visit to historic Southwest Georgia. 
from Macon. I'm Gerald Bryant, wishing you pleasant journeys. Now here's a look at the next Georgia Traveler. Ride the rails through Southwest Georgia. Explore the Springer Opera House and the National Civil War Naval Museum. Enjoy a scrambled dog and discover Georgia's official barbecue contest in Vienna. Georgia Traveler is made possible in part by the Georgia Tourism Foundation. Located 16 miles east of downtown Atlanta on 3,200 acres of natural beauty, Stone Mountain Park features a wide variety of entertainment and recreation for every member of the family. The Skyride offers up-close views of the memorial carving. Guests can take a five-mile train ride or a paddle-wheel riverboat cruise. And the Crossroads area offers the chance to interact with demonstration crafters. The park also features Ride the Ducks tours and the Laser Show Spectacular. More information is available at StoneMountainPark.com and by people are drawn to this state for its unbelievable beauty we're working hard to keep it that way we're georgia power proud sponsor of the programming that also enriches our lives and by the ray m and mary elizabeth lee foundation and by supporters of georgia public broadcasting thank you This has been a production of Georgia Public Broadcasting.